If you open your Bibles to Genesis, the third chapter, we're back to verses 7 through 13. Uh, the shame of sin with the shame of sin. Well, how do you deal with it? This is a great passage of how, about there's only two ways you deal with it. You can go the world way or you can go the word way. And if you go the world way, then you're into a human solution to a spiritual problem. If you go the divine way, then you've got a divine solution to a human problem. One solves it and the other creates more problems. You go to the world to solve a spiritual problem, all it does is create more problems. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how do you deal with the shame of it, the shame and the guilt of sin. Um, if you deal properly with the sin, it'll take care of the shame of the guilt. Because they're connected to the sin. Take care of the sin, you're going to get those taken care of. And you'll see it in the life of that and in Adam and Eve. Uh, we have done, this is several lessons, but I think it's important for us to be able to, now we need to have a word of prayer. Remember some of the people we have that we should pray for in our congregation. Um, uh, Bill Semerle, um, Gary Horton, uh, Michelle Wilmoth. There's somebody else out there in surgery. Did anybody remember somebody else? Well, maybe not. Do it again. Becky oh, Becky Jones. Uh, I think she's doing a little better. The reports I'm getting. Uh, oh yeah, and 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 Joanne Thompson. I haven't heard an update on her. Has anybody heard an update on her? I haven't. Uh, she was diagnosed with cancer, and they were taking a look at that. And I don't know. I have not heard from them. Yeah. Yeah, they were doing biopsy. Okay, well, that's quite a list. And I, yeah, they're both sick at home. Rhonda and Gracie, they got the flu symptoms. Um like so many people, <laughs> like so many people. All right, well, let's, you remember these people. Uh, I've named them, I'm not going to go through a name I'm giving, but I am going to cover prayer for them as they've been mentioned. <clears throat> remember that as a believer in the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins personally, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. You believe that moment you believe it, you receive the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, into your body. Your body becomes a temple of God, and he's there to manage your life for Christ. It's a spiritual life. If you've got sin in your life, like mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, or avert sins, you move into a category called carnality. You're in the flesh and not in the spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you, but you're not in the spirit. You're not walking in the spirit. How do I get out of carnality into spirituality? I confess my sin. Whether it's an attitude sin or a tongue sin or an overt sin, I confess it. First John 1 9, if I confess, then God is just and faithful to forgive me and to cleanse me. The blood of Christ works in the Christian life through confession to restore him to fellowship with God. Okay? So let's be sure we do that before we start our study so the Holy Spirit can minister the word of God to our life. Uh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for these that have come to our church for Bible study, for the youth downstairs, the children, and the adults. What we get out of this service will depend on whether or not we depend on the Holy Spirit and our concentration to ever get what God wants to have for each individual person here today. Nobody should leave this congregation without receiving a word from the Lord it is my prayer that we would get more than one word from the Lord, but we would all get a word, a word from the Lord that would influence our life for Christ. For we find our prayer in his name. Amen. In Genesis, the third chapter, in verses 7 through 11, as we place our eyes on them, 
they were told in Genesis 2.17, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the day they ate from it, dying they would die. They would experience two deaths. They would experience a physical, uh, a spiritual death of separation from the presence of God relationship. And then at w one day later, they would experience a physical death. Dying you will die. We don't know how old Adam was because he didn't have a birth. Adam and Eve didn't have birth. But we do know from the day that he sinned, he lived 930 years, Genesis 5.5. Because, because of Adam's sin, we are all born physically alive, headed for physical death. We count our days down to dying. Agreed? Well, if you, don't agree, if you don't agree, that's okay, but you should go to a cemetery and see what's on tombstones. And this will, this will settle the argument. If you have an argument with me about it, it will settle it because there's a birth date and a death date. You know, I've said this before. The truth of the matter is, of course, you can't sell balloons and, and cake, but you don't really have birthdays. You have death days. You're not going towards birth. You're leaving birth and you're headed to death. Well, anyhow, I didn't want to throw cold water on a good day, but that's kind of the way it is here. Now, watch this. I'm going to show you something out of the book of Job. I, I, watch at the very top of your paper. Job, Job posed this question that's related to today's lesson. Listen to what Job said. Job said, have I covered my transgression like Adam? by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about secrecy of sin. I almost titled my lesson that. When he says that he's hiding his iniquity, notice he committed a transgression and he's in iniquity. What was his transgression? The commandment, don't eat of the tree. It was a commandment. Therefore, it was a transgression. What was the cause and effect? Now his life is in, in, in iniquity, all right? What was the cause? Transgression. What was the transgression? He ate from the tree. Agreed? Do you see the sequence of cause and effect? Do you see the cause and effect? Well, you should see that. Because that's what this, this is what this all is about. So... <clears throat> Job, Job says, I've covered my transgressions like Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. That, that he's talking about secrecy in my bosom. Hiding in my bosom is secrecy. Would you agree with that? I'm not asking for consent. I'm just saying I would like to have you think that. Now watch this. Watch it. Is there such a thing with God? You think you can hide anything from God? Well, in case you do, in case you do, here is Psalms, write this down on your paper up there. Write down Psalms 4421, and then write down Matthew 6 4. In Psalms 4421, it says, God knows the secrets of the heart. Right? You can't hide anything in your bosom. You can't hide anything in secrecy from God. He knows everything about your heart. Now, I'm not talking about the one that pumps blood. I'm talking about the one that pumps information. I'm talking about the one that pumps faith. <clears throat> in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 4, He gives another idea. He gives the idea that God sees everything done in secret. Watch this now. And he, he gives a positive to it and will reward it. See, a lot of things we do in secret are good things that other people don't know about. They're just good things. We do good things 
because we're good people. There's a part of us that always is good. Even when we're bad, there's parts of us that are good and we do good things. Listen, God sees the bad things you do, but he also sees the good things you do and he honors the good things you do. See, it's a positive. It's, in, in other words, here's my point. It's a good thing that God sees all that we do. On the one hand, you can't hide it from God. On the other hand, you don't have to toot your horn. Listen, Ananias and Sapphira, out of Acts 5, you don't have to toot your horn. Because God sees your good works too, right? And he does what? Rewards them. I mean, if you toot your horn, you got your reward. Right? You, you got your accolades. Look. Let other people toot your horn, you know? Let other people do it. So th th it's a wonderful idea. On the one hand, we have Psalms 44. 21. On the other hand, we have Matthew 6, 4 on this very subject of secrecy. In today's lesson, our scripture was used by Job. Right? Job used our scripture. He used my text that I've got today. Not mine, not my, sir. But he used the text. The very text I'm preaching from, he preached on. Well, what did he preach? <coughs> In Job, in Job, Job preached, have I covered my transgression like Adam by hiding my iniquity? Where did he get that transgression of Adam? He got it from my text. It, he got it from Genesis, the third chapter. That's my point. In other words, how old, listen, this, listen, and, and Jesus came to the cross because of it. Write this down. Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21. Job understands the theology of my text today, Genesis, the third chapter, 7 through 13. And he talks about it. He's quoting, he's quoting to people. He is teaching people out of Genesis, the third chapter, 7 through 13. Jesus is using that text idea. Paul teaches that text idea. In Romans 5, Paul is teaching from my text. The same text I'm teaching from. Now, from, from the same text I'm teaching from. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and the sin death passed upon all men, for all men are under Adam's sin. That's the point of Romans 5.12. You and I are under Adam's sin, and the only solution to Adam's sin is Christ died on a cross being buried and raised from the dead. There's no other solution. And so that, you know, what will, listen, we used to sing this hymn, what will wash, wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Christ. Now a lot of people don't sing that anymore because they don't like the idea of wash. But they would if they studied the Hebrew and the Greek because it's the idea of cleanse. Man, how crazy is that? You throw out a great hymn because you, the word wash, you, you pray, take it out of the 21st century and not out of the 1st century or, or, or earlier. That's just my opinion. It's just my opinion. Last week, we talked about the loss of spiritual innocence when they compared their life before, this, before their sin and after their sin. <clears throat> what they had lost was the presence of God, the joy of of the presence of God. They had lost it. And one of the ways that they had learned from last week's lesson, one of the ways they, they knew they had lost their innocence is they knew they were what? Naked. And they were naked and what? Ashamed. In Genesis 2.25, they were naked in the presence of God and were not ashamed. Now they're naked in the presence and they're ashamed. So what has happened between Genesis 2.25 and Genesis, the third chapter, our text? Like verse 7 or 8. Verse 7. 
in verse 25, second chapter 25, they're naked and not ashamed. In the third chapter, verse 7, they're naked and ashamed. What has happened in between? They have transgressed the commandment, don't eat of the tree. They ate of the tree, and now they're in a mess. And they're, they're expressing in the scriptures, it's being expressed by the way they're feeling about the consequences of their sin. All right? This week, we're going to look at four aspects of Adam and Eve's shame of sin that was associated with eating from the forbidden tree. Their transgression of the commandment. Listen, here's what people miss with this thing. Do you realize that the Lord told them that the tree of knowledge of good and evil carried the death penalty? Did it not carry a death penalty? I mean, how, how much more could he say than dying you will die? Is that a death penalty? The, if you eat dying, you're going to die. And listen, here's the, here's the big deal. That penalty has been passed on to the human race. Do you understand that? That's why Christ went to the cross and died to take care of dying, you will die. If you don't believe that Christ came and, and, and his blood was required, his life existent blood was required, which was the pure blood, a man without sin, for our atonement of our sin in Adam, boy, have you got a ways to go. Okay? Point number one. Their shame of sin is a good sign regarding their sense of loss a personal relationship with the Lord God, i.e. walking in the presence of the Lord. Their shame is their, the, the shame and the guilt of that in their own soul, thinking it out, is evidence within them through their consciousness is the evidence within their own consciousness that they've been separated from the presence and the joy of the presence of God. Do you understand that? And it's produced within them shame and guilt. And so does sin. That's the way of sin. That is the way of sin, dear hearts. That's the way of sin. In Isaiah, the 47th chapter, verse 3, Isaiah writes, Your nakedness will be exposed and your shame uncovered. It's exactly what we got going on in our text of Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covering. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day Bible study. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man answered, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And the Lord responded, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of knowledge of which I commanded you not to eat? <laughs> oh, dear hearts. You can't walk it. Once you're into sin, you can't walk it out. You don't have the power to solve it. You don't have the power to solve it. The power to solve it is outside you. And it, it has to focus on the cross of Jesus Christ. When you confess your sin in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you. It's because it has brought you to the cross where God and you are reconciled through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
you have returned to the position of your life of reconciliation that brings you into fellowship, not relationship. It brings you that back to reconciliation for fellowship, not salvation, sanctification. My, my. What a wonderful God we serve. What a wonderful God. <clears throat> when your nakedness is exposed and your shame uncovered, good things begin to happen in your life <clears throat> if you will understand your recovery system. Because God wants you to live a new life <clears throat> full of changes. One of the most exciting things in my life is the concept of every day being a new day. Every day is a new day in the Lord. It's not an old day. Boy, if you're living in the old days of your life every day, your feet, you, you crawl out of bed and your feet hit the floor and all you're thinking about, oh, woe is me of my old days. What a miserable day that's going to be. You've already started out in debt. <clears throat> you don't want to do that, dear hearts. What did God require of them regarding the effect of their sin? What does he require <clears throat> for, for, for such as their spiritual nakedness, their hiding, their avoiding, their shame and their guilt and the covering up of their sin by human works fig, fig leaves? What is God requiring of them? Here is their state. Here is the condition of their life. And it's a mess. It is a mess. Listen, it is a mess. They are spiritually naked. They feel bad about not having a fellowship relationship with God. They're hiding, they're avoiding, they're shame, their guilt. They're covering up their sin with good works, fig leaves. Well, what does God require of them? He hasn't required any of that of them. None of that stuff will bring you back to God. All of that stuff is because you've left him. That, that is, all of that in your life is because you have left the dynamics and the joy of the presence of the Lord. What does he require for you to get back? Listen to me. Do you have to go through the process of working through your guilt and all your shame and all your hiding, all your avoiding and how, all your goofiness? Listen. If you're a believer, you confess your sin, you name your sin, and God takes you back. He cleanses you and brings you back. In, he cleanses you with the blood of his son and brings you back into fellowship. If you're an unbeliever and you're in this mess, your life is just chaotic. Listen, you need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins to clean up your life and to bring you into a brand new, wonderful life in Christ. You can be in a new man. You can walk out of all of the mess of your old man into a new man life. He will exchange it. That's the most amazing. You talk about the miracle of God's grace. That's a miracle of God's grace. And if you're a believer, if you will confess your sin, he'll bring you back into that, a restore a new relationship. One that you know that you had and now you don't. And don't sit over there and, and, and spin your wheels and hiding and all that. Get out of the muck and the mire of life and back. How, what do I have to do? You get, listen, your guilt won't bring you back. Your shame won't bring you back. It's got, it offers you nothing. It's an awareness. It's a good thing if you're aware that you have lost the dynamics of the joy of your salvation in living in the presence of an almighty God. We're in a mess today. The church of Jesus Christ is in a mess. We're in a mess because we don't understand some of the simplicity of what it means to have a relationship with God. Your life, your life would be just content without any of this God stuff. And how is that possible? 
how is that possible? God asks the question, who told you you were naked? And then he answers it. Isn't that interesting? He answered it with another question. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? He didn't wait for an answer. He asked another question. And what, what did the other question do? It got down to business. First question. Who told you we're naked? We could, listen, they would, they would spend the whole day lying on it. Well, the devil, is, they would stand there and point the finger at each other, which they'll do later. They could write a book on what, what happened. But let's get to the solution. Let's stop wallowing in the failure. And so he says, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Right? Listen, I say to you today, it's time to come to clean up your sin. Clean up your sin. How do you do that? Well, I guess I just have to suffer through a little while longer. Oh, I guess I just have to... I think I probably should move away. Oh, I think I probably should get a divorce. Oh, I think I probably should... Uh, 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 oh, I think I ought to... It, it's not you. You don't have the solution in you. All you do is have the failure. If you want to get out of the failure, then you've got to go to God who in his marvelous grace will lift you out of the muck and the mire of all the mess you have created and establish a new person in Christ. You think that you got yourself in the mess and you have to clean the mess up in order to get out of it. Nothing could be farther from the truth. If you will confess your failure, your sin, and come back to God, he will treat you in grace. Why would you not take that deal? Well, I think I should pay for my sin. I, listen, the sin's been already paid for. This, all sin was paid for with Christ on the cross. You don't pay for your sin. Just because you want to sit around and mope and, 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 and feel sorry for you and, and pay penance, you can't pay penance for sin. My, my people, what is wrong with you? Why do you think that way? None of that is true. That's all a lie from the pit of hell. It's time to, to come clean with your sin. How do you do that? You confess it. If you're a believer, you confess it. 1 John 1, 9. And he does what? He cleanses you. Do you see the power in that word? And how, how, how much cleansing does he give me? How much forgiveness and cleansing? As far as the east is from the west. That sin is no longer. And if it's still with you, you haven't bought into the idea of confess your sin. As soon as you confess your sin to the blood of Jesus Christ, it is gone. It is gone. It is gone. Say inside your heart today, it is gone. As far as the east is from the west, so are your sins. So you need to be confess specific sin, whatever it is, and the blood of Christ will cleanse you. The blood of Jesus Christ restores you to fellowship, brings you into the dynamics of what it means to be. In a, listen, I meet Christians that don't even understand what it means to be in the presence of the Lord. They think you have to die. Listen, was Adam and Eve in the presence of the Lord? Yes. Before they sinned? Then what happened? They lost it. Then they had to come back the salvation way to get back to get back into the what? Presence of the Lord. You don't have to die to do that, but you don't have to confess your sin. And let me tell you, you need to learn how to live in the presence of the Lord. It's not just on Sunday you have to do it. 
You need to have that Monday, halfway through Monday, when you just can't breathe anymore. You go like, I don't know why. Step away from the world that's, that's mocking you and beating you up. And, and, and listen, get quiet with the Lord and sense His presence and His power. And He'll bring you back to the purpose. And He'll give you the drive forward. You've got to learn this stuff, my dear hearts. You've got to learn this stuff. No, point number two, now Adam and Eve see their spiritual nakedness and the shame of their sin as something inherently bad and in need of covering. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that, that, that's very interesting to me. All of that was in their conscious and their mentality of what they had lost. How did they get it back? The sense of loss was so great, they wondered, how do I get it back? Agreed? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you. And listen, listen to me, listen to me. That's another form of hiding. That's another form of hiding. You got to be careful of that. You got to be careful of that. See, what, 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 what can restore me? What can wash away my sin to restore me here? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood. Did they go to the blood? No, they went to human. They didn't go to God. They went to human effort. Right? What'd they do? They started sowing fig leaves. That's human effort. What can wash away my sin? Fig leaves. We got a new hymn for the church. Well, we'll wash away my sin. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Fig leaves is the day. That might be a movie. Notice that they didn't cover themselves from the weather, from each other, from other people, from animals. <coughs> for an interview for a new job? Listen to me. But from the presence of the Lord, they sowed fig leaves. Not to have an interview. Well, I look pretty... How do, how do I look at them? Well, you look shameful. <laughs> look shameful. Well, look, I can look, I look, I look how I look. I got the fig leaves and... I got them all decorated, and you know how long it took me to find enough to have this look, and look how I look. I look so good. Shameful. They, they didn't do it for any of that reason. They sowed fig leaves to solve the problem of not being in the presence of the Lord. They thought they could decorate themselves to be a, to have the appearance that would, God was saying, oh, oh, Eve, you look so good. How do you come on in here? You look, where are your fig leaves? Hey, come on in here. Adam, I don't know. <laughs> did, you, did you sow your fig leaves? Yeah. Well, well, you should have had Eve do it. Uh, human effort. Listen, we all think that we can cover up our stuff, but it can only be what? Only thing that can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Christ. Come on. Notice that they thought they could cover the shame of their sin with fig leaves. Human good. Where did they get this idea? See, I, I'm struck by that. For me, I go like, where did they get this idea? Right? I mean, the serpent, Adam and Eve, are the, I mean, that, that's the three guys going to Bible study together. So where did get the, they get, get this idea? They sat down and go like, what do you think? Maybe. I don't, they, but whatever, the, wherever they got this idea, it, listen, it was Cosmos Diabolicus, agreed? Wherever they got the idea, were they coming up on their own or they went back to the serpent and said, what do you think? And they had a consensus, and he won the argument. They go, well, let's, let's do fig leaves. It doesn't matter, 
because it was all cosmos diabolicus. It was all worldly thinking. It wasn't biblical thinking. It was, it was all the other way. Paul, when he identifies this, he calls it the futility, the mateotes of the mind. And here's how you get mateotes, according to Paul. You go, you go negative volition to God, you go subjective to a solution, and you go to the world to solve it. And he calls it futility, meaning that when you go negative to the word of God, you open up a vacuum in your soul that sucks in worldly view. America and the church of Jesus Christ today in America is eaten up with Mateotes. We got churches identifying all kinds of things that the Bible calls evil and they're calling it good and establishing it as a benchmark in their churches. And they're going to destroy Christianity in America. And that's the only thing that makes America great is Christianity. It is the light of God that burns strong in America that has made America great. It's nothing else. Well, listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 2. We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterizing the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Boy, you ought, to, you ought to read that about 12 times next week to understand it. In other words, people are always looking for substitutions for sin. And there's nothing but the blood of Christ that will do it. Point number three, the covering of their loins is interesting. They covered, they didn't cover their face. They didn't cover their head. They didn't cover their body. They covered their loin area. It was an attempt to avoid dealing with the internalized shame and guilt of sin. They had internalized sin. When you internalize sin, it becomes shame, it becomes guilt, it becomes remorse, it becomes all kinds of negativity in your emotional view of life. And that's exactly what they did. And they thought if they did fig leaves over their loin, they would be okay, right? Listen to me, I told you this last week. What did that, what did the loin covering symbolize? I told you what it symbolized. Loin, I wrote it down again because you didn't get it. The loin covering of divine truth is used in Ephesians 6.14 as part of the full armor of God against Satan. Ephesians 6, 10-17. Now listen to me. Paul describes the importance of the first piece of equipment put on the full armor of God. You know what the first piece was? The very first piece that held everything else in its proper order. You know what it was? The belt of truth. That's the loin covering. Do you know what the second, third, there were six pieces, but the very first piece was the belt of truth that was over the loins, the loins covering. And it held, it was the first piece that put everything else in its proper order. And when you study that Ephesians 6 chapter, it's not about the armor that goes on. It's not the shield and it's not the helmet. It's what they represented. And, and what they represented was very important to your life. For example, after the belt of truth went on, then you had righteousness, the gospel of peace. You had faith, salvation, and the sword of the spirit, the word of God. 
it all fits off from the idea of truth. The Word of God. The Word of God that has been assimilated within your heart and you have internalized it as truth. The Word of God, listen, the Word of God isn't truth when you hear it. The Word of God except in, in its own identity. The Word of God is always truth in its own identity. When you hear it, it's the Word of God. It becomes truth when you cycle it to your heart. It becomes truth. The Word of God becomes truth in your heart, not in your ears. People will say, well, I've heard that before, but I don't what? But I don't believe it. Oh, I've heard that before. I remember when I heard it before. And I remember, listen, I can remember things when I hear certain truths. I can remember where I heard them. I can remember how they changed my life. How about that, Marianne? I mean, some of you guys, some of you guys and gals have been with me a long time. And there are benchmarks in your life when you heard things that were just revolutionary and they became truth in your life and you grabbed it and you, you made decisions your life based off of some basic truths in your life and you are here today. You should be having these experiences all the time, my dear heart. You ought to have these experiences all the time in your life. Uh, Paul, Paul writes in that Ephesians 6 passage, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Listen to me. Listen to me now. Look up here. Where do you think Paul got that idea? Where do you, where you got it from a Roman soldier? Nah, where do you get the idea of the loins in truth? Where do you get that idea? He got it from a Roman soldier. He got it from Adam and Eve. Eh? Dear hearts, he's the guy that wrote about it in Romans, the fifth chapter. He got this the same way Job got it. The same way the psalmist got it. Same way you're getting it. What is the first piece of clothing most people put on when they, when they dress to go to school or work? Nine times out of ten is to cover the loins. And then you start working up from there, right? Well, you say, I put on my socks. I know. I'm just making a comment. I should have said, what do you do when you're asleep and the doorbell rings? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying how important loincloth is, is what I'm saying. The build of truth, divine truth of categorical Bible doctrine, such as we're teaching today, was the first piece of full armor to put on for victory over Satan. It positions everything else in its proper place of spiritual warfare. Paul put truth on before he put everything else on. And he used a Roman soldier as an illustration of the first piece and how important it is to the rest of the uniform. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand, be able to stand firm against the schemes or the strategy of the devil. Paul wrote, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So in spiritual warfare, Satan has schemes. The Bible refers to these, this idea as wiles or craft or deceit. The Greek calls it methods. Later in 2 Corinthians 2.11, they call it devices or noima which means it now is involved in human perception. The noose is where you get perception, and the heart is where you get comprehension. In other words, it's the faith cycle. It is the faith cycle. Well, there's many, much more for you at the end to read. I would encourage you to read that, especially this one note, three things the devil told Eve. <laughs> Just remember, he's a liar, liar, and his pants on fire. You don't want to listen to the devil, buddy. You want to listen to the Word of God. you got to put your head in the Word of God to understand it. And uh, I want to thank you for coming today. We're going to take an offering. This is for those that are members of the congregation, of course, and 
you're a visitor, that's fine. In Jesus' name, amen.